Sure. Well, hello again. Uh, glad to be back with you. I'm Danny Lee. This is Christy Saunders, and we're at Grace Church of Simi Valley in Southern California. So back for another session and talking through ministry to children. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time last session talking through biblical foundations and philosophy. Um, probably spent a little bit longer on that one just because uh, sometimes I get going with it and excited to really talk about those things and what they mean. But uh, out of that and out of that first session and leading into these next couple sessions here, really once you have your foundation, things should just begin to practically flow out from there. And so uh, I hope you at least followed through what we were talking about last time. And as we jump into this next part here of what's, uh, um, how things begin to start practically forming in your mind, I hope it um, answers maybe some questions you have of what you should be focused on, but then also um, start, uh, start narrowing down on what's the most important. And those being not just your mission and values, but what's your goal and what's your target gonna be. So we're gonna look at some of that yeah. stuff uh, today. Okay, so let's jump in. Practically speaking, now that we've discussed all the whys a church would have a children's ministry and what the Bible says about that and giving it a purpose and all of that, what is the practical ways that this would start to work out in a church? Yeah, and I think, uh, and I actually, there's a verse that I'm reminded of um, that uh, I didn't read yesterday, but just reminds us again of like, what's one of the what's one of the mainstays of the church? Again, one of the main primary purposes of the church. And uh, just drawn to 1 Timothy chapter three and verse 15, where Paul's writing to Timothy and Paul's writing the church and he gives the statement here saying, you know, if I delay, because he wanted to come see them, he says, you, uh, I'm writing these things if I delay that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. And so Paul gives this very important reminder that the church is to uphold the truth. Like the church's commitment is to the truth of the word of God. And that is not ever anything that the church can compromise. It's not anything that the church uh, should deviate from. Because once you lose that, once you lose that uh, foundation of that framework, um, then you've lost what the purpose of the church is. But then he also states in there how you should behave within the household of God. And we talked a little bit about it yesterday, just in regards to a, a local church body even being like a family um, and how we, how you conduct yourself and how things play out within your local body ministry and how that um, may look different than another church down the road and practically how they do it. But if we have the same biblical principles and biblical foundations, really at the heart, principally, doctrinally, theologically, uh, there should be a lot of things that look similar and should be the same. And so even when it comes to, I think, uh, just even the outflowing of ministry stuff here too, uh, and having a, a strong foundation of your ministry, even what you're aiming for, you're accomplishing, like what, you know, what we do in children's ministry, how do you make that stick? I think there are a couple things that really should come to the forefront. And the first one here is about uh, teaching God's truth, of uh, teaching God's truth, that the church has a primary responsibility to teach God's truth accordingly. And in doing so, it means that not just even the main service, but I think in our, in our, with our kids too, uh, that we teach them the whole scriptures as the scripture presents truth. We're not uh, it could get very easy, I'd say, sometimes with our kids. Um, we like telling them stories. Uh, we like doing things that would obviously like capture their imagination. Um, but sometimes we could tend to shy away from just the plain truth of the Word of God, or we use it more. Sometimes we even use the Word of God as kind of an object lesson to teach a just a moral behavior. And one of the one of the downsides, I would say, sometimes when we maybe approach our kids is we so much want a, a certain behavioral outcome from them. And so we, we think very pragmatically or we kind of respond in that sense of because we want them to behave a certain way, look a certain way, um, or not embarrass us, right? And keep our reputation intact that we, we more focus on the outward side of things than really at the heart that we needs to be dealt with. And so I think in teaching God's truth, if we really believe that and we don't really, 
in one sense, dumbed down the scriptures for children. We'll talk about age of appropriate learning and things like that, but we don't, we don't hide from what God's word says and we shouldn't hide from teaching our, our children what God's word says. Then we're gonna trust that as God's spirit works and as God's word works in someone's heart and in someone's life, no matter what age they are, then that fruit is gonna come, that, that behavior is gonna come. And even when Paul mentions in 1 Timothy 3 there, when he talks about how you ought to behave in the household of God, um, it's not, it's not again, just those moralistic outward behaviors that would be just, you know, the, the, the fruit of something that was an inward transformation. It's like saying, no, because you believe these things, because you've been changed and transformed by the, uh, Jesus Christ and the word of God and with the people of God, then there is a way that which you should conduct yourself and which you, which the, the church of God is going to look like. And so I think even at a young age, when we start with our kids, that we, we, we need to start at the core of things and we start with teaching God's truth. And, and, uh, I, and I, there was a great, um, there was a great resource I had a number of years ago that uh, helped me as I was um, even preparing myself for going into children's ministry and how I wanted to approach with our kids, how I wanted to train our volunteers, um, what was the mindset I wanted in our classes even as well. And one of the things was just, again, how, how do you present the scriptures? And there was a few key things that came down that the reason why we teach the scriptures the way that we do, and even different than preaching, say, by a pastor on Sunday morning, but specifically in kids' classes, that we want them to learn the stories of God. And the scriptures are fantastic for that. I mean, they're great stories, right? And and, uh, and unfortunately, Personally, uh, a lot of people treat them just as that. They treat them as, right. as, as just storybook type of things. And there are some great children's Bibles. I like collecting different children's Bibles and uh, children's books because um, just either the pictures or the visuals or maybe sometimes of the artistic interpretation of it um, is very encouraging and just a different way of thinking of it than I would. But I also want to be very careful that I'm not... I'm not taking away from the main point of what God's word is saying about himself or about ourselves as well. And so you do got to start with the story. And so it's very easy, especially in Sunday school classes with our kids, we can really go through a progression of both biblical and chronological stories in the word of God. And, and we do, we, we go with old, we start in Old Testament, take about a year and a half to do the Old Testament. And then we go into the New Testament, we take about a year and a half to go in the New Testament. So we're teaching the, we're teaching the stories of God within there. But then in that, like what's expected, right? Like it's one thing to be a good storyteller, but it's another thing, I think really in wanting to reach our kids and teach our kids, we've got to make sure that we don't miss the point. <laughs> we don't miss what is the main meaning of this passage? What is the main meaning of this of, of this account in here? Um, not always the application, we can get to that, but if we follow a consistent interpretation method and going through, we realize there should only be one consistent meaning when you go through a narrative scripture, or go through a passage, a passage of scripture. Now, there are going to be a lot of implications. There's going to be a lot of applications maybe out of that, but we don't ever want to miss what is the main point that God is instructing us um, maybe revealing about himself to us, or maybe it reveals about ourselves uh, and in light of God's holiness. And then also I think in there too, like what does God then expect? Um, what does God expect of, of our response to him, um, either out of obedience or just even an attitude and submission to him? Um, there should, anything that we learn from the scripture should evoke a, a response. Um, for instance, in one of our Sunday school lessons uh, coming up here, uh, it's, we're in the Old Testament and we're coming up on an Exodus and we're going to be talking about uh, the worship of the golden calf. Uh, when Israel just had come off of um, being released as captives out of Egypt, and then God provided them in the wilderness with the man on the water. They go to the mountain of God. Uh, they hear God's voice as he gives them the Ten Commandments, and they have this incredible experience where they actually experience the presence of God. They hear the voice of God. They receive the commandments of God. Um, and of course, soon after that, right, they fall into quick disobedience um, and worship, break the first commandments, right, and worship uh, worship a false god in there. And it'd be very easy to maybe take that and just, uh, uh, and, and in a false way, you know, be very careful what you bow down to, right, and be very careful what you worship and things like that. And and those could be good implications and applications. But I would say even out of that passage there, and and part of why that story is in there, it does show us a lot about the fickleness of the hearts and deceitfulness. Of 
of, of, of uh, people's minds into sin. But it, it really truly highlights, it highlights the holiness of God and God revealing himself and then how man quickly falls into following his own passion and desires and rejects that and refuses that and how quickly our hearts are turned away and then God's, and then God's punishment for them in that um, and the salvation he gives. And we always wanna make sure then that when we come and teaching the word of God, that we're not, um, we're not getting far away from what the main meaning um, of, that, of that passage is. Um, I think in a, in a practical sense, and we've worked through this um, at our church several times, would be in maybe the type of curriculum that you choose for your church or what you're, um, what's going to be a kind of the backbone of how you're going to approach teaching your kids and, and um, informing your families. And we've gone through several different things throughout the years. Uh, I've used several different curriculum types. Um, when, I, when I first started uh, in the children's ministry uh, position here, I, I was wanting to go away from what we had and was wanting to move towards a different direction. I didn't really find one that I was real satisfied with at first and um, and probably more out of youthful pride and arrogance. I decided to write my own curriculum for a year and very quickly realized in a year's time, I'm like, I can't keep up with this, this is too much. Um, but I, I also learned for myself a lot of what was it that I was really after in a curriculum and, and um, different resources that I studied and prepared for. Um, and it's too much work, by the way. Don't 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 do that unless you just are really gifted with that, and the Lord's giving you that. Um, there's too much great material out there. You don't have to write it yourself. Um, and probably arrogant of me to think I could do it better than everyone else, right? Uh, but then what we end up doing uh, in that time too, we we took the time to do kind of a curriculum search, and so I did end up researching several different ones, um, and I kind of landed on five that I was the most comfortable with because it kind of followed along the lines, at least. Um, at least in the areas I wanted to make sure we highlight. And one, uh, at least for me and what we were looking to choose, because there's a lot of great methods and great designs of things. Um, I particularly was looking one that was going to go through the biblical storyline. And so starting kind of in biblical chronological order that way. Um, there's other great ones that teach different theology approaches and, and highlights different doctrine approaches and things like that. Um, and I think those are great uh, ones as well. But as I was looking for one in particular to go through that way, and then I was also looking for a couple of other elements and I pulled together a team of teachers and parents and so we we uh, we read through all those together we met a few times we reviewed we critiqued and then um and then actually simply it came down and we voted as so we voted on what we wanted. Um, but it was it was sifting through and, and I used that time because I got some other people on board as to how we were gonna approach those things. But um, but there were a couple key things that I appreciate, at least the curriculum that we chose at the time um, that we are currently using as well. And one, it does highlight the biblical chronology of the story. I really appreciated it in this one in particular, and there were others that did this, but the one we have here, um, it does take all the scripture, and I feel like um, appropriately so, in the Old Testament, it has always a, a Jesus Christ connection point. So it is connecting things um, into how Jesus is going to be ful the fulfillment or was the fulfillment of those things in the Old Testament. And of course, in the New Testament, we study Jesus, we see how he is the fulfillment of those things. And then as we finish out the rest of the New Testament, we see what we look forward to in Christ being our King. So I appreciated that uh, aspect that was in, in that curriculum as well. But it, at the heart and the core of it uh, was teaching the main points of the scripture um, and laying out those uh, the, uh, doctrinal truths and, and teaching in that way. I love that aspect that you talked about, which is um, not just pulling out moral stories, because with my own kids, I've seen those aha moments where they're realizing, oh wait, this is a whole story of my story, of my salvation. And um, I don't even know that I had that as a kid. It was a lot of the, the, the story of Jonah and the story, and those were great, and I learned things from them, but actually seeing their, them get excited that it's all pointing back to Jesus and their salvation, it makes so much more sense to teach in that in that manner. Um, so if we are teaching these things, and this is what we're presenting to our families, then how do we train our families to like apply it? Yeah, and this is where we wanna make sure that um, we uh, take the truths that we're teaching and then now here's where wisdom comes in, right? Now now it's gotta make sense. It's gotta, what, what do we, what do we want these to be taught for? And um, the way I kind of have it down uh, in, in my thinking that I put in my notes was that we want to train, in all these things, we want to train a God-centered thinking. And um, 
that sounds very nice to say, right, or very easy to say, but uh, I think one of the ways that uh, in our teaching times, again, it's not just storytelling times, um, but we're wanting to bring it to, we're wanting to bring it to a point where how does, how does someone begin to view themselves under uh, the authority of God, under the sovereign rule and and the graciousness of God. And so there is a part where as we approach these things and as we're instructing these things, are we highlighting really who God is, that God is great, that God is glorious, that God is gracious, that God is good. And even, uh, and I love actually, just as we've been in the Old Testament at the moment and just recently taught through the Ten Commandments, um, being able to approach that and again, and if you're in a um, if you're in the mindset that your Christian life or you approach the faith as uh, as a um, an area of performance of do's and don'ts that duty that regulation um, really what tends more the legalism side of things then you can very easily look at the laws of God both in the Old Testament and the New Testament and just say okay I need to not do this and I need to do this and it becomes that even if you don't like to admit it it does become that checklist in our minds. And even with our kids, when it's when it's easy to be black and white with them, right? And they understand things in context of black and white, and that's good because that's how God's designed them. They don't, my father-in-law used to say it this way, uh, that uh, when the kids are younger, they can't, they can't always understand the gray areas yet. And so why are we more often black and white with our children, especially when they're younger? Because there is right and there is wrong, and there is obedience and there is disobedience, and that's how God's wired them and engage them to be even at a young age to understand. Um, and so it also need to be how we approach them and making sure that we're very clear about what is the truth and what is not the truth and what is what is what relates to obedience and what is disobedience. Um, but in that too, if we only just teach what's right and wrong and we never tell why things are right or why things are wrong, and particularly as it relates back to who God is and who God's character is and who God's what God's holiness is and what God's goodness is, then our kids would then begin to have a view of God that he is just this, um, he's just this arbitrary judge um, who makes the rules and you can't argue with them because he could just zap you out of existence, right, type of thing. And, um, and God becomes very heavy handed in that way. And I think one of the things that, um, that I've appreciated from other older parents that have influenced uh, my, my family and my thinking, um, other, uh, other resources of pastors or ministers and children's ministers uh, that really helped at least shape my thinking and understanding, especially in approaching kids, um, that I do want to be careful that I'm not presenting God as this overbearing old man who's just out there to dole out punishment, right? Um, he's not the father time figure, just just waiting things out for you and then can you know hit you with a lightning bolt. Um, that we want to make sure that we're very clear that we are showing how all things root back to the character of God. So even last, uh, even recently for us teaching on the Ten Commandments, really teaching the Ten Commandments of what gracious what a gracious way that God explains himself. And what a, and and even Moses writes later in the book of Deuteronomy, like how, how kind of God and that the nation of Israel was supposed to live in such a way that it would be, in Deuteronomy 7, 8, 9, he talks about how the other nations would be attracted to Israel because they'd say, what great God that you have that he has made known to you. <laughs> He's made known to you his commandments because everyone else was living in, uh, in a sense, they didn't know what their God expected. They were living out of, uh, they were living out of fear. They were living out of, they, they bribed their gods with offerings and sacrifices. Um, it wasn't revealed to them what their God expected of them. Of course, they were worshiping false gods, so they were never going to find that out. But our God has revealed to us who he is and what he expects of us. And so I think as we even go into this uh, with our training of a God-centered mindset, we do, we do want to train our kids. And then we want to help parents also see and understand too, are you, even in your home, but are we here, are we bringing things back under the authority of God? And it's learning to live under God's good, submissive uh, authority. Um, and maybe I mentioned last time that we, we, we recognize our kids are born sinful, and so we know that in them is a heart of rebellion, and we pray and pine for their salvation, if you will, and we, and we ask for God to be merciful to them, to call himself in salvation. Um, but even when our kids aren't, or maybe you grasp that, understand that, 
uh, we can still teach them that everyone lives under authority and there's a proper response in God's, uh, God's good design that we are all to submit to some authority. And it actually goes well, even for those who aren't children of God, right? It goes well when people live properly uh, under right authority. And so there is a part to be able to teach under the sovereign rule of God. And what it is, we pray that one day that they would submit themselves and their own heart and salvation in regards to confessing their sins and submitting to his lordship in their life and that they would yield to him as their savior, but then also as their good shepherd, that God is, that in Jesus Christ, he is our good shepherd who protects us, who provides for us, who leads, uh, who leads us. And so just in all those things that helps us, uh, helps us teach with our kids, but also train them in the mindset, you're living under um, the authority of God's rule, and that's a good thing. Um, it also means that you have personal responsibility before God, and so you need to take response. God does hold us responsible for our actions, and so there are consequences. There are There is responsibility for your actions, and you have to give an account before God one day. And in that, that they would see and maybe recognize, like, I'm not very good at this, or I can't, like, I can't do this. Like, you're right, and that's why you need Jesus Christ. And do we point kids to treasuring Jesus Christ because he is any of our only solution for not only knowing what is right, but is doing what is right and treasuring, and, uh, treasuring Jesus and exalting God in those things. And I think when it comes down to maybe even a practical side with ministry, like how do we train God-centered thinking? Um, it can be very simple. We, we understand that with um, w within our children's ministry, and, and like I said, I oversee everything from preschool to elementary right now up to uh, up to sixth grade for our elementary. So that's a that's a that's a swath of an age gap, right? And so obviously, I'm not putting all those kids together. I'm not expecting that I can teach them all the same thing together. We have class divisions, and I think there's good appropriate divisions that happen within those age groups because there's different levels of understanding. And and it's good for you if you haven't considered or haven't maybe even uh, looked up a little bit or figure out what's the right places for uh, uh, age level, class level divisions for appropriate teaching, uh, that would be good. For instance, uh, in ours, we do nursery mm -hmm. to preschool. We do divisions by age. Mm -hmm. And then when we hit elementary, actually starting first grade, we do uh, class divisions by grade. Um, we do that so that they're kind of within that peer group thing. So we do age divisions. Uh, they move up according to their age. And then once they hit elementary at first grade, particularly, um, we divide up the classes accordingly by grade. And that gives a bit of a freedom then too as to how to teach appropriately, right? So there are some things that we're going to tell a sixth grader, but I'm not going to say it the same way to obviously a kindergartner, right? Um, one of the things I appreciate uh, coming back to even our curriculum setup and structure, at least how we approach this, and this was something I even did from the beginning, was I wanted our families and our kids in particular, um, that they were going to hear the same uh, Bible lesson on Sunday, no matter what age they were in. Um, and we've done different. I, in fact, when I first started, I wrote it differently, did it differently, but I kind of had landed on, no, I want I want for our families, I want for our kids. So whether there's a preschooler, a second grader, or a fifth grader, they all heard the same Bible story lesson that morning. And so um, so even as we're in Exodus right now in the Old Testament, they're all hearing the lesson about the Ten Commandments. Um, and then it has, uh, and then we talk about it and teach it in an appropriate way. And there's different conversations and discussions that can be had at each of those age levels, right? Um, another great thing as far as training God-centered thinking um, is very simply through music and through memorization. Mm -hmm. um, and our most favorite music actually is the music that is just scripture, in fact. Seeds. Uh, Seeds Family Worship is one of our favorite ones. Um, there's uh, some other great uh, bands. There's uh, Sovereign Grace. Sovereign Grace is in Sovereign Grace Music. Uh, there's one that's kind of funny I heard about recently, even heard a song this morning. It's called Slugs and Bugs. Oh, yeah. Um, the Slugs and Bugs, it's, uh, it's a little bit newer, but it takes the scripture and puts them to great music as well. Um, and so we've done that, whether we've had people to be able to play it live or whether we do music videos or just kind of acapella and voice and 
I'm not that great, but I'll lead a music type of thing. <laughs> it's not um, yeah, exactly. So we, you know, the fun classic songs that Jesus Loves Me and the B-I-B-L-E are, of course, great. Um, but I think a way to help train a God-centered mindset is even through music and through music uh, memorization and, and music and, uh, um, and scripture in that way is a, is a great thing to go together. Um, we have it set up, and, and I appreciate our curriculum did this, but it's, it's something I was moving towards anyways, as we do a monthly memory verse. Um, so we have one passage uh, for each month, or it goes with each section of our, of our um, curriculum that we use, but um, one verse that we work on for the whole month. And so um, whether a kid misses a week or two, they know for about four weeks we're working on this verse together. And, and that's the same verse for all grade levels. Now, we, we, um, it's, it's concise down for the preschoolers. Maybe they were, learn one line out of that verse, right? Um, the older kids learn maybe you know two or three verses that we're memorizing. Um, and then if I can or if we have it, I usually have a song that is that scripture memory song that goes with that. So not only are they saying it and repeating it, and my teachers do maybe fun memory games with there as well too, but then they also sing it and remember it as well too. Um, but that those are those are aspects that help train that God-centered thinking. Um, and then with it too, I, um, I really maybe more out of, uh, not necessity, but more out of maybe a little bit of conviction anytime I teach with kids now. Um, I... Uh, I really teach with some sort of object, an object lesson. Um, it's something that I wasn't very good on early on. And when I used to uh, be youth pastor and teach, um, the poorest thing I was at was illustrations. Um, but you realize like how much Jesus taught in illustrations, the whole set of the parables, right? And you, and when you have those tangible things that help connect a great weighty truth of God to a practical understanding, it just sticks with you a lot more, right? And so I had to really work on it and it wasn't something that came natural to me. Um, I actually had a, an older Sunday school teacher at our church um, that when he retired, uh, he came to my office one day and handed me a box mm. with like all his stuff, right? And there were ping pong balls in there and uh, mustard seeds in there and all this type of stuff. And he just said, he said, hey, he said, this is the stuff I used to use. I used to collect it a lot. He's like, I don't know. He said, you can throw it away if you want, but I thought I'd just pass it along to you. And uh, he was the first one that really prompted me to to think about, I need to really think how I'm gonna engage our kids in teaching. And so just even things like that, whether it be, um, sometimes there's some fun games and activities that we can do in our classes. Um, maybe there's a great craft that you can do um, with, the, with the class as well. Um, or maybe it's just that, a very tangible uh, um, object lesson or maybe involving the kids with the lesson just to bring it to bear and bring it to light. But never forgetting, by the way, never forgetting what is the purpose and I always have to make sure that anytime I do something like that, an activity or a game or a craft or things like that, I always make sure I come back to, okay, why are we doing this? Here's why we're doing this. Here's what it tells us, or here's what it illustrates us, or here's what it reminds us about this truth of what uh, God, is, God is teaching us. And all those everyday objects and things help train the God-centered thinking, right? And that's why when you're at your home or you're around, like, and you remember how Jesus did it with his disciples. He'd be walking through and he pointed to the uh, things in the temple and said, I am the vine, you are the branches, as he sees the vines molded and sculpted on the side of the, um, in Jerusalem there. Like, there's all Always things that you're looking at. How can you engage your child's mind and thinking to think? How does this relate back to God? And how is this? How is the truth that mag magnifies and illustrates God as well? So, but what is it that parents should be expected to do with all this? So now it's like we've given all these lessons to the kids. The parents want to engage. I know as my for myself, like I want to piggyback and keep expanding on what I know my kids, and it's great because they all, I have four, and so they're all learning the same lesson, but expand on that. How, like what, how can as a church, can we support parents and help them be able to like follow through with all this and guide them in guiding their kids? And I, some of that comes back to, we, we talked about in the last session a bit about, um, really so much of this is reflective of, of parenting, right? And, and that's why I'd say like with children's ministry that, um, there's a there's the there's a gateway opportunity 
to really reach families and reach parents or reach guardians or uh, whoever it may be that has the carers bringing them. And and part of that reaching that to them isn't just um, isn't just we want them to be saved, hear the gospel if they don't know it, or just for friendship relationship. Just go, hey, you have the same, you know, we you have four year old, I have four year old, we should be friends type of thing. Like there should there needs to be intentionality in pursuing our parents, and especially if we as the church as a body of believers um, are gifted with in with one another in regards to fellowship, there needs to be a purpose. Uh, a, a purpose in how our relationships form and how we pursue those relationships with other families in our church. And I think especially with uh, families with young kids and that being the main training time and the main developing time, it's a time of preparation there, then what my real goal is, is I want to reach parents so I can help them know how to guide their kids to live wisely, right? If that's if that's part of our discipleship role, even as parents, um, and then as the church of coming alongside and equipping that way, then part of the goal is is reaching our parents so that they can learn how to guide uh, their children to live wisely. Because really, when it comes down to it, um, you've got maybe at best an hour, an hour and a half, maybe a couple hours on a Sunday, maybe maybe midweek you've got like an hour, maybe an hour and a half, two hours if you have a midweek program. Um, if you do a monthly family activity um, or kids activity, that's what, maybe another two, three hours, depending on what it is. And just in those things, those are snippets of time, but really where the main core, it's gonna be in the home, right? And the home is where it's gonna flesh out. And so we wanna help our parents understand, again, that their primary responsibility is to be leading and guiding and directing their kids and knowing these things and repeating these things and affirming these things, of searching these things, of being able to answer their kids' questions, right? And so uh, we want to make sure that we are helping our parents feel supported, for sure, um, helping them know uh, at least how to maybe talk and think through things. And so I would say in guiding our parents to live wisely in this way, as far as I feel a responsibility in the church, uh, if part of us is guarding uh, the truth, right, but also dispensing the truth as well, too, I need to be in communication with my parents. Um, I need to have lines of communication, forms of communication um, consistently with that. And thankfully, with technology and a lot of other things, there are a myriad of ways to stay in contact, whether it be through whether it be through email, whether it be if you still do snail mail, uh, whether it be through social media, however it may be. Um, but you need to have an avenue of consistent communication with, with your parents. And that can be broad, um, to have broad things. We send out a monthly newsletter. Um, we'll send out other updates uh, during the week or every other week about, hey, here's what was the lesson that was taught this last Sunday. Uh, here's the memory verse we're working on this month. Here's the, uh, we also have um, what's called a big picture question and answer. And so every month along with our memory verse, we have basically like a catechism question. So there's a big truth about God in the form of a question and then there's an answer. And so we work on that all month. So the kids are being able to answer uh, these questions. Um, but communicating that with your parents and having them know what it is that they're hearing, that their kids are hearing so that they can have interaction, whether it be something to take home on Sunday, but we also know a lot of that gets stuffed in the trash or stuffed in the side of the door, right? Um, so what are the things midweek that could be followed up uh, followed up and done? Some There are some curriculums that are really great about that. Some write all that out for you, provide all that. Some have midweek emails that are already done that you can send out. Some have at-home apps, you know, or an app that you can download on your phone um, or your iPad so you can do those things at home, and those are great, um, but they may not be available for everyone, or you may not have the resources to purchase a curriculum that has all those things, right? But you can do something, and I would say that um, it would be incumbent upon you um, to have some form of broad communication, which then leads that you also need to be in direct communication with your parents. Um, to have a shepherding list uh, is what we would call it around here. Um, I have our I have our class rosters, right? Um, we do some we do check in by iPads, but I also always have a printed roster for our classes, and that's for safety reasons and things like that too. But what's great about that is I see those rosters every week, and I see those families every week, and I know which families are here regularly that I can engage with regularly. But I also can see which families haven't been here for a few weeks, right? And then it prompts me to call them and say, Hey, how are you? guys doing? Are you guys okay? Has your family been sick? Uh, you guys, did, have you gone to another church? You know, what's going on there? And not being afraid, not being afraid of conversation with parents. And 
and I think even in the hard things too, and it is hard, it is hard sometimes to hear that a family maybe has left your church and something they were unhappy and dissatisfied wise. And it's hard not to take it personally if they say, hey, we didn't really like your kids program here and things like that. And you take that personal because you put so much time investment. Um, but sometimes it's, it's, it's more valuable to make the call, to be able to ask and to find out and hear the criticism or critique sometimes, or maybe invite criticism or invite critique, I should say, of others. But then also doing that with your families that are bought in or parents that are bought in or even your kids that are bought in, drawing them in and, and engaging them and hearing from them, not just what they would like to do or what they're learning, um, but just what's going on with their families. And that shaped a lot of the things that sometimes that we've done just practically as far as either uh, kids' activities or family activities or reaching families midweek or otherwise. It's been more a lot of just that communication with, with my parents um, uh, to find out where their family's at, what are the family needs, what's the culture of your church, what's the culture of the families in your church, um, how many of them are involved in outside things, um, how many of them are have all the maybe same type of schooling type format, um, uh, where are your kids located in regards to schools or um, just even geographically as well, but having those lines of communication. Um, you may want to think about what it is to maybe offer some things for your parents, for your families, for the single mom, for the grandparents even in particular, um, of just the ways of engaging kids and conversation. Um, there's good moments to have. I think um, we do, uh, we do uh, child dedication, family dedication here. Um, and so anytime a family wants to go before the church and really they're dedicating themselves, um, that they are publicly saying that, hey, before the church family, that they want to raise their child in a way that would be God honoring and fearing to the Lord. And we usually do that when they're younger, infants, toddlers, things like that. But I always set up a meeting with those families just to talk through them, how they're doing, what's going on, what are the main things that should be taking place in their home and training their kids. And so that's an opportunity. Um, when a child professes faith, uh, when they make that profession of faith, um, it's a great conversation to have with the parent. Usually the parent has a lot of questions, right, or doesn't know what to say. And so there's a good conversation there. When I have someone who wants to be baptized, um, I always make it a point to meet with the parents and talk with the family, not just the kid, but I want to know, do the parents understand? How do the parents view this as well too? And get the chance to talk what, through what baptism is and talk about faith and submission to Christ and what, what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. Um, but being engaged with your families that way and that way you draw them in that way and help, help support them in regards to the way that they're going to guide their children to live wisely. And then we pray, right? We pray consistently, we pray for, we pray with, we pray about um, our families and our kids. Um, not just in the hard things, not just in the heavy things, but just in the regular things, the mundane things, the consistent things. And we, we praise one another for the great things that we see God doing in the family's life. Um, and we weep with one another when those hard things happen, but we pray to stay engaged and to stay um, even spiritually connected, if you will, that way. Um, and then things that, oper that provide opportunity to come together. Um, there are fun activities to do, but do you have, do you have maybe some mission-minded things to do? Um, are there things that maybe your church does or that you could do as maybe as a kid's ministry that also would draw in the parents? Um, for instance, our church, there's a couple local ministries that we support. One is called Children's Hunger Fund. Um, they're a local parachurch ministry that truly does partner with local churches, um, but they take excess goods and they try to take those goods and package them in a way uh, to send them into neighborhoods or communities, both nationally and internationally, uh, just to help. And But they do it through the local church so that when someone receives something from Children's Hunger Fund, they're actually receiving it from a member of a church. And uh, there's times that we do like big packing drives for that and all that way. There's been times where we've delivered those as well too. And so there's ministries like that. Our local pregnancy center, community pregnancy clinic, um, has been something that we've supported as a church and do the diaper drives and things like that, host a banquet. Um, but we also have families that um, uh, that have served in those arenas too. And I know that's larger church, but those are things to keep mission-minded wise, missionaries that maybe your church supports or wants to support, um, talking about them, learning about their country that they're uh, serving in, learning about the family that they're participating with, but things that would draw in and engage and prompting some of those conversations maybe at home uh, that they could further have with their kids um, as they as they would learn about those things. Okay, so like 
We've talked about so many different principles, and as you said many, many times, these all will play out differently in different churches, um, but that there's things that would hold true no matter what the church is. And um, some of the things I like really focused on or took from that is focusing on God's word as a whole boldly and not just in pieces and not missing the point. Um, really helping our kids to have um, God-centered thinking, but in the character of God and uh, submitting to his authority, be, authority because of his goodness, understanding his love and why they would submit. Um, some important things would be tools to help them hide God's word in their heart, like songs, different things. And again, would look different in different churches. And that is really crucial to reach the parents through various ways. And um, again, each church would look differently. So as a church, you can ask yourself, how would you apply some of these principles that Danny's talked about today? And what are some questions you can ask yourself to um, put these into practice? Yeah, and as you would work through these on your own, uh, I think, uh, again, um, uh, not being overly excessive in one area over the other. Um, you could be maybe too heavy in the teaching. And what I mean by heavy is maybe you don't, I'll say this for kids, don't make class boring, right? Don't make it all about, don't don't teach first and second, third graders for 35, 40 minutes, right? Um, it's okay, it's okay to break it up. It's okay to, it's okay to use teaching videos. Um, it's okay to use some other resources that would be engaging in those things. And I'm not trying to compete with the culture and what we're doing here, um, but I do want things that are gonna be engaging and interactive because kids have different learning styles. Um, but I wanna make sure that that's balanced appropriately. Um, and maybe your church loves music and does music really great. Make sure you highlight that. Highlight the things that your church does well but make sure that you are um, supporting and advancing other areas that are important and especially to worship and to training and so that comes down maybe to the type of what you're going to what you're going to decide to teach for your children's ministry the type of curriculum have evaluation of that is this hitting the mark is this something our kids actually like um, do parents can parents pick it up is it easy for your teachers to to teach it right is it teacher friendly sometimes too um, and is it make sure it's not too similar simplistic, that it's never maybe hitting the heart of some of important truths, both doctrinally and theologically, um, but make sure it's teaching the right things um, in that way. And then and then how you break things up and how you engage things. So think about the type of music that you that you would like to introduce your kids to. What are the songs that you want your kids to learn? What are maybe, um, what are older songs? Whether hymns or just great praise worship songs that you would like your kids to grow up in? Um, but there's great stuff out there continually and how would you use that? And maybe you're not the one to pick that. Maybe you need to ask someone to help you uh, to, to choose those things. And then just other ideas that you can engage as far as whether it be Sunday or weekly as well. Um, how much activity uh, are you going to do? Um, you want to be careful that you don't um, we're not an overly programmatic church. Um, our priority is relationships and personally that way. Program is going to flow out of that. And I'll say in kids ministry, we're probably the most programmed out of all the things happening in our church. And you need structure and you need form of things. Um, but I want to make sure that our church isn't known about its program. I want to make sure it's known about its people and how we care and shepherd and the things that we do in equipping that way. So what are the things that you could highlight and do monthly? Um, things that you could do to engage? What are the ways, that, what, are you, what are you communicating to your families that way? So those are just some of the considerations as you work on these things together, um, how, how it would um, affect your choices of maybe teaching choices, music style, activities, um, uh, um, craft, um, whatever those things may be, what you're communicating to parents, all those things to consider um, as you talk about those things together. Well, thank you again for listening to this session, and we look forward to seeing you and teaching you at the next session.